All right. Is this on a timer, Mariana? I feel like it's moving. I believe, the, I believe the slideshow may be on a timer. Yeah. Um, you can click through it and just take it back to the beginning. Our PowerPoint is resting. All right, welcome everybody to the California Desert Coalition um, Defend the Desert Workshop series. The webinar for tonight is Power of the Purse, Federal Appropriations and the California Desert. Hopefully you're in the right room. <laughs> um, can, next slide, April, if you can, <laughs> if it'll let you. So just some quick reminders about Zoom. Everybody's probably really familiar by now, um, but please stay on mute uh, unless you are speaking, in which case remember to unmute. You can always use the chat feature to um, write in a question or comment and we will get to you during the Q&A. You can also use the raised hand feature during the Q&A so we can um, keep, keep the questions orderly. This is a small group, so I think we'll be able to manage. Next, a little bit about us. If you aren't already familiar with us, we are a non-partisan nonprofit um, committed to the protection of the desert landscape across the Mojave Desert. Um, we focus on building grassroots coalitions and engaging people on issues shaping the desert um, and advocating around those issues, uh, educating people around public engagement processes and government and political processes uh, and building our grassroots into strong advocates for the desert. And so of course we advocate for community driven and desert conscious policy and land management. And here are some ways that you can get in touch with us and stay in touch with us. We have um, recently finished a big upgrade to our website. Uh, we continue to add new things and improve upon it. So please visit. Also follow us on Facebook. We're adding new stuff um, to that pretty regularly and it's where you might find some more timely announcements. And then you can always contact us at info at desertcoalition.org. Um, we tend to respond pretty quick and uh, that's a great place to ask questions or share ideas um, and provide feedback. And now about our speakers tonight, two good friends of mine, I'm very proud they could join us tonight. India McKinney, uh, who is currently the Director of Federal Affairs for Electronic Frontier Foundation. And she was the former legislative, she's been a, a former legislative assistant a couple times around and a former legislative director in the US House of Representatives for um, members of the House from California, three different members from California, one of whom was on the Appropriations Committee and she uh, served as his appropriations staffer and has dealt with numerous appropriations issues um, throughout her career on the Hill and through her portfolio. And now as the Director of Federal Affairs, um, she deals with appropriations on a regular basis from the other side of the, other side of the coin. Um, she is my go-to expert on appropriations issues. And then we have David Feynman, uh, who some of you may know from previous webinars. He is currently the Director of Government Affairs at the Conservation Lands Foundation which does a lot of work in the California desert and protecting the California desert. And he is also a former Hill staffer who has dealt with uh, appropriations and bills of all sort as part of his portfolio. So we've got two really great, great experts here tonight. Um, and I will, with that, I don't think there's any other slides. <laughs> nope. <laughs> that I was supposed to be deleted. Um, I will turn it over to India to start off. She's gonna give us an overview of what is appropriations. Um, I think a lot of us are pretty familiar with the idea that we um, protect and conserve our landscapes um, or species 
or watersheds um, through various legislative means. We, we can pass bills to create wilderness, for example. Um, we can ask the president to create national monuments that also help protect lands and landscapes. Um, there are a number of other tools, but many of us forget that there's this whole appropriations process. And what is that? It's federal funding. Well, what does that mean? So just because we pass a bill to create a wilderness does not necessarily mean, we often hear people say, oh, if we do this, it's going to come with money. Well, there, there has to be an action taken <laughs> for it to come with money. And um, when we when we say, oh, there's not enough rangers and there's this backlog of maintenance and there are all these resource management plans that still need drafting and there's these illegal incursions. Well, that comes down to staffing issues oftentimes as well as some other issues. Um, but all of that also comes down to resources and funding. Um, and that is the realm of appropriations. And it's a very powerful realm and it's a very important one for all of us to be aware of and understand how we can potentially engage in that process and with legislators um, to make sure that they are paying attention to that side of things as well. So we're not just asking for passive law to protect lands or species or whatever. We need we need the money too. Um, so India is going to walk us through what that looks like from a process perspective, and David's going to follow up showing us a real life case study that he is actually working on right now. India, take it away. Awesome. Well, you stole some of my talking points, but that's okay. Um, so feel free to reiterate, you know, repetition is important in the learning process. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. Um, all right, so can you see, let me fix this little square here. I'm just a bill. Yeah, the little, I'm just a bill appropriations friend. Um, so it's really useful to start, I think, with sort of the basics of everybody knows how a bill becomes a law. I mean, we have this cool little song about how a bill becomes a law and that's great and everything, except the bill skip, the little song is great when you're in the third grade, but when you're actually trying to get something done at the actual federal legislative level, it leaves a whole lot out. So first things first, as Mariana mentioned, there are more than two types of bills, but there are two big types of bills. Um, most of what you think of as a law or most of what you think of as a bill when Congress passes things, um, most of those are going to be authorization bills like the bill that they're working on today and gonna to do final passage in the house tomorrow, the Protecting America's Wilderness and Public Lands Act. That is an authorization bill. Uh, appropriations bills are a very specific type of legislation and they're incredibly important because they're only valid for one year. It's how the federal government funds itself for one fiscal year. So, when you fund the government, the fiscal year begins October the 1st and it runs through September 30th of the following year. This is the congressional fiscal year. And this is important because there are 12 appropriations bills that must be signed into law in order to avoid a government shutdown. If you've been reading the news the last couple of years, you will have noticed that we've had partial government shutdowns as well as full government shutdowns. And so that means if the uh, president signs into law the you know, the DOD pro appropriations bill, well, the military is fully funded for the rest of that fiscal year, but if they don't sign the interior bill, well, then the parks are closed. So you can have a partial shutdown, um, depending on what's funded, what's not, but September 30th is a firm deadline. If it's not signed by midnight, September 30th, that portion of the government is shut down. And that happens a lot more in recent years than it ever used to, which has impacted the process, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. There's a way that the process is supposed to work, and then there's the way the process actually works. And so we're going to focus on more how the process actually works, because that's the part that's useful. So before we go further, I just, I like to, um, so on the left here, that's fiscal year 1789. It was a two page bill, one bill. It funded mostly the post office and the Navy. 
Um, so if that at that point in time, the Appropriations Committee was the responsibility for the Committee of, on Ways and Means, which Congress also established in that same year, that wasn't a whole separate congressional committee uh, because the government wasn't particularly big. And so the same committee that raised taxes also spent the money. It wasn't before too much longer that Congress decided that it maybe wasn't a good idea to have the same people who in charge of taxes who was also in charge of spending the money and there needed to be a little bit more of a separation of powers even within the House, so they separated it into those two things. So also the original sum of money that was appropriated was nothing. Uh, today, the budget of the federal government is about $4.1 trillion on average, and that's the money that is on budget. That is not anything that is off budget or overseas contingency or anything else. Uh, that is the actual budget of the United States. But generally speaking, there are a couple exceptions, but generally speaking, any money that the federal government spends in any fiscal year has to be included in one of these 12 appropriations bills one way or another. There is some wiggle room within the agencies. They don't tell you how many pens you're allowed to buy and stuff like that. But it does do things like dictate the number of full-time employees that any given agency can have. Um, it dictates the total number or total amount that you can do for office expenses, other programmatic things, and in some cases, some project level uh, spending. And so each of the bills is wildly, wildly different. So all you nice people are gonna care mostly about the interior environment and related agencies bill, which is not a bill that I am particularly familiar with, but um, that is where you're going to want to look to find all of the things that are happening in all of the areas that you care about. So when you're looking at the bill or the budgets or trying to figure out what you want to talk to Congress about, there are a couple of important numbers that you want to look at. So first is what number for your project or program was in the president's budget. So what is the president, what is the Office of Management and Budget, what is the agency requesting for this program or this project? Um, so this year, the president normally we would have already seen the president's budget, but it's different the, in an inauguration year because the president doesn't have his team in place. Like right now, we don't have a director of OMB um, because that has been a super fun process in the Senate because it's mean to be mean on Twitter and you shouldn't get a job in the government if you're mean to people on Twitter, apparently. So um, we sort of need to figure out who the director of OMB is gonna be before we get to see the president's budget, but you still wanna know what that number is before you go up to the Hill. You also want to know what was in last year's actual bill as passed by Congress. Um, sometimes the president will request something astronomical or sometimes the president will request something tiny small and Congress ignores it entirely and does what they want. But those are still two very useful numbers for you to know. The other thing that I find particularly useful, and this is a little bit of my bias as a former House appropriations staffer, is this comes from the fiscal year 21, which is the year that we're in right now, uh, interior appropriations bill. I just picked a project that fit on the slide. Um, so this is in the committee report. So each subcommittee and the subcommittees for the appropriations committee match up with these 12 bills that they pass up here. What oh, didn't let me go back? Oh, there. So there is a subcommittee, appropriation subcommittee on interior environment and related agencies. And so they're going to spend the entire congressional year working on that particular bill. And so that committee is going to write a bill that has all of the funding included for all of the programs. And they're also going to have a uh, bill report that goes along with each bill. And the bill report actually has a lot more information than the actual bill text does. The bill text is what gets signed into law, but the bill report, the committee report, it comes, it gets published when the committee passes the bill and it's instructions from the committee to the agency on all of the things that you should be doing with their money. The bill is usually pretty straightforward. This much money, period, this much money, period. The report is gonna have a lot of additional language about how 
and why Congress is appropriating this much. Um, the committee is also concerned about a lot of things. The committee has feelings and they put their feelings into the report. So if the committee is concerned that the program is not doing what it's supposed to be doing, they're going to possibly want the agency to submit a report back to the committee 180 days after enactment of the uh, passage of the overall bill to give the committee more information about what's going on. So it's a really, really useful tool for you to make sure you as constituents, these are all public, they're on the website, for you to know what the committee is already looking at. And so if you want something to be changed or you want something to be different, this is a really great place to start when you're trying to figure out how to build on what's happening. Because if you don't build on what's happening, if you're trying to start from scratch, that's really, really hard. And so the other question I get asked sometimes is what if I have a project or a program that I want that isn't in the president's budget and didn't get funded last year? And the answer to that question is it is not happening. Figure out how to do what you want within something that's already a line item on the bill. Getting a new line item in the bill is almost impossible. You have to have presidential sign off from the Oval Office. It's really, really hard. So then let's say, this is actually what Stephen Colbert said, would you consider legislation to fight future Sharknadoes? So that's cool, but you can have legislation to fight future Sharknadoes, but as Mariana mentioned, if you don't actually have funding to fight future Sharknadoes, it doesn't actually matter what legislation to fight Sharknadoes says. If it requires money and the money doesn't go in the appropriations bill, it doesn't happen. So a really great example of this is the No Child Left Behind Act, which funded or which authorized Congress to spend all kinds of money on childhood education and literacy programs. But then Congress appropriated almost none of the money that they were authorized to spend, which means the bill means nothing. Um, it's just gathering dust on someone's shelf. We haven't done another uh, education reauthorization bill in a while because everybody's so terrified about how hard it is. The Congress just didn't appropriate the money. So when you start talking to staff about the things that you want to do, there's a couple of things that you need to ask first. And I'm sure David will get into all of this as well. But you want, instead of just saying, would you consider this legislation, if you're talking about appropriations, you ask the office, an individual office, for their appropriations forms and their office's deadline because each office is going to be very different. They're gonna require different information from you for their own internal purposes and their own deadlines are going to be different than their deadlines to the committee. So the way it works is every office, all 435 house offices by a particular deadline, if they choose to participate in the appropriations process, which apparently the House Freedom Caucus is choosing not to participate in this process because reasons, um, you have to, as a member office, you have to enter a bunch of information into a super crappy antiquated database that is going to crash a lot as you are trying to enter information. And they have to write a letter to each appropriation subcommittee ranking the order of their requests. So each office is going to ask for information from advocates of all the programs and the projects that they want to support because the offices have to do a lot of work on their end to figure out what the correct order of all of their requests are. Um, is this a project that the boss actually wants to support in the first place? Are there any ethical issues with the problem? Is there going to be press issues? Are there going to be constituent issues? You really just have to run through all of the possible issues for each particular request to make sure that it all is the way that you wanna do it. So then usually in non-inauguration years, the deadline for member offices to submit their stuff to the appropriations committee is mid-March. This year it's definitely gonna be later because again, we don't even have a president's budget yet. So it's hard to know what exactly we're working with. The president's budget is like the opening salvo of the negotiations for what the budget's gonna look like. Um, but I don't know, the offices could still have their deadlines for submissions from the outside world by like March 3rd. So it's usually really, really early. So you wanna ask that question first because you need to know how much you need to scramble to get your stuff in on time. Because if you miss the deadline, you miss the deadline. That's it, you gotta wait till fiscal year 23. And so then if your boss is not on appropriations, you're done. There's really nothing else for you to do. You could, as the member, 
you know, hassle the subcommittee chairs for your particular priorities, but that has limited success. Um, if you are in appropriations, then the work is really just beginning. Because even in a personal office, that's when oversight hearings begin and you start bringing agency heads in and asking a whole bunch of questions. So again, as constituents and as concerned members, it's always possible to submit questions to the offices who are on the appropriations subcommittees that you're interested in and say, you know, hey, as the as this particular group, I'm interested in these issues. Could you ask the agency director these questions? That's always something that staff should be willing to hear and consider uh, because their work is not done. So then after the oversight hearings and the submissions to the database, all the subcommittees, uh, subcommittees release their bills, which include spending limits and spending limitations. They release the committee report and we really start the process and when we start marking the bills up. It's really important in this part and this is where it starts to get really wonky. One thing that I used to have to deal with a lot as an appropriation staffer is, you know, my bosses weren't from California, they were usually from pretty liberal districts. And so I would have people come in and be like, okay, just do one fewer F35 and then you can fully fund this education program that I want. Just do one less weapon system and then you can fund this immigration program that, because we need more advocates in the immigration space. And it's like, okay, I am totally with you on all of these things. And if my boss were the king of the world, those things would be fully funded, but he's not. And also that's not how appropriations works. Each of the 12 bills, there's two big numbers that you have to, this is a zero sum game. This are, they're two big numbers. There's something called a 302A allocation, which is the number that OMB has decided that the government is going to spend on running itself for this fiscal year. And then there's the 302B allocations, which is how much money each one of these 12 bills gets to spend. So that's why it's a zero sum game. If you spend more money on this program over here, it has to come from a different program over there within the same 302B allocation because it has to add up. So there's use, so in a bill like interior environment related services, they're gonna be sub allocations within that. So like the Department of Interior is gonna get X percentage of the bill and the different agencies are gonna get this percentage of the bill and that percentage of the bill. So it gets really complicated and the math has to add up. So if you see, once the bill has been introduced and you're trying to work with an office to do an amendment, either in the committee process or on the floor process to plus up, increase a particular account, the money has to come from somewhere. We call those pay fors. And so once you start taking money from other accounts, that's when people start getting mad. And it's really, really, really hard to come up with a pay for that doesn't piss somebody off and tank your amendment because they're mad at you for stealing their money. So of course, if the House and the Senate and the White House cannot come to terms on a bill that both chambers can pass and the White House can sign, we end up with a shutdown, um, which has happened a lot. So um, some things to keep in mind in this whole process is there's a political process and there's a policy process. And this time when I'm saying political process, it's internal politics, internal to the Hill, internal to the committees, internal to the personalities involved. There's members talking to other members and I have definitely seen things get done because members just happen to like each other and they're willing to do go the extra mile, go the extra distance to like do a solid for their bro. And that's not a thing to take lightly. You can really, really get stuff like that done. Also, policy can be really complicated. Politics fits, fits on a bumper sticker, but individual policy is really hard. That's what makes it fun, but that's also what makes it hard. So depending on what you're talking about, and it really matters what the you know, temperature of the nation is, in the case of y'all's interest, literally the temperature, the climate, um, there's going to be committee politics versus party politics versus national politics. You know, we're not in an election cycle, but we're always in an election cycle. Is there a particular thing that members super care about or not, um, that they really wanna hang their hat on um, one way or another? So one of the things so you can see behind me, this is the 
you know, refurbished National Mall. And there was a big hoo-ha a couple of years ago when there was money in a stimulus package to refurbish the National Mall. And a bunch of Republicans pitched a whole fit about like pork barrel politics or something, 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 because we put all of this money in the interior bill to keep the National Mall from sinking. That was completely politics. That was completely national politics. They needed something that they were just going to yell about. And that money got into the next interior bill and nobody said a word about it. And so then the mall, the gray water system got put in and the mall is way nicer than it was. It's actually like green and pretty and not like brown and splotchy. So um, all of that is something to keep in mind. And um, I don't know if you want to go straight to David or you want to do questions, but that's all I have prepared for you right now. Let's, um, yeah, we're, I'm going to pull an audible here. And uh, since we do have a little bit smaller group, let's pause there for some questions because you gave us a lot to think about. Um, thank you for covering the process from the, the perspective of the staffer in DC and, and what, um, and the and members in DC and like what has to happen. Um, does anybody want to jump in with a few questions for India right now? This is this is Fraser. I'd love to ask the question. Fraser, your your Wi-Fi is a little a little jumpy. Is anybody else getting that? Yeah. All sounds like Max Headroom. Also. I'll stop my video. Is that better? That is better. Yes. <laughs> okay, good. I'll just stop my video while we're doing this. And uh, if we wanted to propose a specific project in a California desert for a new campground or a new parking lot for a trailhead, um, what's, what's the best path to do that? Would we do that through the agency itself or through our local congressional office? Um, so both, really. Um, you definitely want to talk with the local agency, the people that would be directly overseeing whatever that project is, because um, without their support, then the congressional office is not going to move. Like, that's the first call the congressional office is going to make. Like, they're going to call the local agency folks and be like, what do you think about this? And if they're like, yeah, that's not a priority for us, then your request goes nowhere. Um, having the backing of the agency folks because agencies have their own lists of like what they want to do and where they want to spend their priorities and that's part of the whole OMB process. So agencies, the way it works with OMB and they keep the process a little shrouded in mystery on purpose, but generally speaking, the agencies submit their budget to the OMB mid-summer and then the agency does, OMB does a whole bunch of math and then sends it back to the agencies around October and then the agency send it back to OMB with their edits or whatever around Thanksgiving. And so then by the time the president does his State of the Union, mid-January, that's the budget that you get. And every agency head is going to go up to Congress to sell the president's budget. That's their job. So if you're requesting something that is contradictory or uh, opposed or not in the agency's budget or list of priorities, you're going to have a really hard time getting traction, even if the congressional office is totally in. Great. Thank you, India. We have a question in the chat. Um, how does a constituent get in contact with an office managing the bill that we're interested in? Um, so all members have their contact information for their DC and their district offices. Um, on their websites. Um, it will be, if you're not a constituent of Shelley Pingree, for example, um, it's going to be difficult to get in to see her office unless you're some, unless you come as part of an organized group, unless you're part of the California Desert Coalition. Um, they're going to try to push you back to your home representative, or at least they're going to want, going to, want to know why you haven't started with your home representative. Um, so if your home representative is an anti-conservation Republican, that's a great answer, but um, it's harder if there's somebody who would be more amenable to the process. Um, the members like to let 
each other handled their own constituents um, for a lot of actually important reasons. Um, committee chairs can be a little bit different, but there's not really a process for an individual constituent to submit a request to an appropriations bill outside of their own member. The committee won't take outside requests directly. You have to go through an individual member office. Or the first question they're going to ask you, because I've certainly lobbied the committees directly, the first question they always ask is, do you have a member who is supporting this request? And ideally you say yes, and ideally you say yes, and it's a member who is on the appropriate subcommittee. Or, yeah, and that bears mentioning that, oh, I'm sorry, what was or, the last thing you said? Or like a hundred members. Yeah. It bears mentioning that that is true of pretty much any interaction with uh, members of Congress. It's important to at least try to go through your representative first, um, for that matter, your senator as well. But the, the House is really the body that is designed to be most responsive to um, the people. Uh, so you do need to go through your representative first. And if that does not work, you can certainly try other avenues, but as India mentioned, the best other avenue would be to be part of a group like this one or other groups that are organized um, and organizing more broadly, where at that point, there is no one district necessarily or one constituency. You're speaking for many constituencies across, you know, theoretically across the nation because you're talking about an issue um, versus a uh, something more localized, even if that issue is localized, but you're kind of talking about the impacts of those issues on a broader level. Um, but it's always best to start with your member of Congress who for, for most folks in the area of the desert where we work is um, Ober Nolte, who was elected as a freshman, first time uh, member of the house in this election. So he is someone that we should all be building relationships with his office. Um, we have another question in the chat. How do funding allocations usually become available once the appropriations bill bills pass? And how do you identify these sources? Well, the source of the funding is taxpayer dollars. Um, that's that's what appropriations is. It costs money to run a government and um, that's what taxes go to pay for. Um, there, you know, there's some exceptions. Um, I think the USDA is partially fee funded. There are some immigration programs that are partially fee funded. Um, like some of the national parks stuff is partially fee funded, but that's incorporated into um, what and you'll see that in the report language, partially incorporated into how much money we're allocating from the treasury. Um, like we're expecting you to get X amount in revenue and we're giving you this much from the treasury. That's how the post office works as well. Um, so how do you know? So, I mean, they're public laws. Um, in theory, the budget committee at the beginning of the year puts together a budget and that is what, and Congress passes it, and that is what the 302A and the 302B allocations are. Um, in practice, that has not really happened in the last couple of years. And so if you've been hearing about the budget reconciliation process, that's related, it's complicated, don't really have time to get into all of that. I hate the budget reconciliation process because I was an appropriator and I want you to go through my process because that's where I get to pull some strings. Um, so, Often what will end up happening is the first meeting of the Appropriations Committee, usually sometime in May, um, if the Budget Committee hasn't passed their budget resolution for the year, the Appropriations Committee will take a vote where they deem the 302A and 302 allocations as passed. So the committee just takes a vote, we have decided that's what it is, and then we're going to get on with our work. Um, that's really more efficient. Um, because the budget is 
the budget res resolution is not binding like it's the whole thing is weird but um these are public numbers they do show up in the public record you just have to know where to look usually the omb will have it on their website they won't necessarily call it the 302a allocation just like the appropriation so um house.gov is the house um U.S. House of Representatives website, and then you go to the appropriations.house.gov, and that will have all of the links for all of the individual subcommittees. And so you can click on the documents or the fact sheets or the news. And so all of the subcommittees will have a lot of information there from last year's press releases, last year's fact statements, last year's bills, last year's reports. When I was looking for last year's report for the interior bill, that's where I went. You can look all of this stuff up from the Library of Congress as well that's harder, the Appropriations Committee just has it all on their website. If you know, once you know where to look, it's pretty easy. Uh, but what you kind of have to get through a couple layers of the onion before you get to that part. And they don't usually lay it out quite as easily as I, like I would keep a spreadsheet of the 302A and the 302B allocations. Usually just on the front page of the bill, they're like, this is how much money we're spending. And then they go. They're really we have um, three more questions. A couple of them uh, are going to get into some details that mm, we might be able to tackle a little bit more later. So I'm gonna hold. Um, one of them from Ted is, how can one backtrack what funding might have gone into a specific renewable energy project? And India, perhaps, um, perhaps you can answer this, David, you might be able to answer this as well, um, just because you have a little bit more familiarity with the DRECP. <laughs> this is, seems like a pretty DRECP question to me. Um, but India, for your context, I think this question is related to um, renewable energy projects on public lands that have been uh, very, let's say very popular in the California desert. Um, very popular amongst uh, developers, maybe not so popular amongst uh, residents and um, tourists and such, but um, definitely amongst developers. And I think the question intends to find out um, if these projects are being funded through appropriations in any way. So there's a couple of things that could be happening. Um, and so David, I'll kick it to you if you know which one of these it is. Um, but sometimes there's it helps if you know what year the project started or the pot of money that was used to pay for the project started, because then you can look up the report language on that particular year and figure out the whether or not it was a, a straight appropriated project, like the government is building this. And so it goes through this process. And so that's all gonna be laid out in the report for that particular year. Whenever the government constructs something and there are very limited ways in which the government constructs things. Um, usually it's only through HUD or for military construction. Almost everything else is public private partnership. But whenever the government builds something that the government is going to own, they have to outlay all of the money in the first year that it's author that it's appropriated. So if it's a five year project, they'll say we're giving you a billion dollars to be spent over five years. And then the next couple of years, they may have something in the bill or not that's like we're still continuing on with this project. But like if the project goes badly, then you may see appropriations language in there being like the committee is concerned that you've spent half a billion dollars in a year and nothing to show for it. So can we have a report on where all that money went, that type of thing. What's more likely is there was money put in for a particular type of project and then left the bidding process to the agency. And so then you have to go check the um, notice, what is it, NOPA, notice of funds, NOFA, notice of funds availability in OFA. So they'll put a thing out on their website that says, we have these funds that we want to spend on this particular project and we're inviting you to submit bids for that. Usually at that point, there is also, a public comment period on the various bids that they receive and then whatever bid they select is also uh, supposed to be put on the website for transparency reasons and other things like that. So it's a multi-step process, but it really helps if you know what type of project and what year it began. 
Yeah, the, the only thing I'll add to that, that's a perfect summary. You need to know the land management agency where that project is being implemented. So if it's on BLM land, then it would be through the Bureau of Land Management. And you would want to go to their website to get the information if it's the Park Service or Fish and Wildlife, whatever it is. So I think that the point that India is making is that, you know, not everything that comes through an appropriations process details exactly how that money is going to be spent. In most cases, the federal agency that receives the appropriation, you know, there's a whole process within that agency about how they spend that money. And so you would need to look on their website and get the information there. That's not to say that the agency is not responsible for how the money is spent or that Congress is not still paying attention to how the money is spent. Because again, if the agency misspends the money or the contractor misspends the money and the agency has a done proper oversight on the contractor misspending the money, Congress has and will get really salty about it. And they'll cut funding for like the secretary's office or whatever, like they'll get pissed off. That's really fun. Um, it does bear mentioning as well on this point, and perhaps some of our other board members can jump in uh, a little bit later for a little bit more clarity, um, but many of the renewable energy projects that take place in the desert are, um, they're not built by the government, <laughs> so they're not necessarily subject to um, the appropriations process. Uh, a, a company is building them, and they are leasing uh, effectively the land from uh, the federal government, um, which is also not part of an appropriations process. Um, with that, please keep registering questions in the chat if you have more questions. I'm going to turn it to Dave to take the all, everything that India has taught us and show it to you in a real life scenario. <laughs> Um, and then we'll open up for some more questions. So you want to find money to do something. That's really, I guess, your point, right? So everything India just said sets the stage for an example that I'll give. So I know some of you, uh, in fact, a couple of you on this call have actually signed this letter for your organization. And I appreciate that. But I will give you a case of what uh, Conservation Lands Foundation is doing within this process. So uh, for those of you who don't know what our organization does, we protect, restore, and expand the national conservation lands managed by the Bureau of Land Management. And we do that with the support of a lot of local nonprofits across the West, including some represented on this call. And uh, I've been in this job for four years as government affairs director. So I'm the, the person in DC for this organization that supports the work of friends groups to try to make sure they have a voice uh, in Congress and as of January 20th with the White House. And a fundamental problem that I identified and my colleagues knew of before I started in this job is that the National Conservation Lands have been growing, growing system that was uh, created by the Interior Department in 2000 and in a sense codified by Congress in 2009. They've been growing precipitously over those years. In fact, since 2000, the system at the time had 18 million acres of national conservation lands. Now it's more than 37 million. So you've had all these national monuments, national conservation areas, uh, historic trails added to the system. That's more acres, more places to be managed. But as I think, you know, a very important point that India made is you can, you can create things through laws but you have to pay for them. You have to have people to manage them. You have to have people to uh, implement the programs. Um, and you need appropriations to do that. And the problem is over the years as Congress through public laws and the president through Antiquities Act designations has created more units and added more acres to the system, the money to manage those places has actually shrunk. It was in a certain, and I'll, sh I'll actually show you because I have done the research and I have uh, um, a graph to show this. The money was precipitously going up and then we had the 2008 and 9 recession. And uh, I won't bore you with all the processes around what we, you know, sequestration was it a, a really fun topic about seven or eight years ago where everything in the federal, everything in appropriations was, had a haircut to deal with the economic fallout. But basically the money 
went off a cliff, was cut in half, and then since 2009 has very, in small measure, increased as, while at the same time, Congress has added millions of acres to the system. And so when I came into this job four years ago, and I would meet with groups in the California desert and elsewhere out west, they would say, well, we have all these acres that need to be managed. And, you know, there's like 3 million acres here and there's one person to manage them. And we've got all these trails that need to be uh, managed and all these facilities that have to be built. Um, there's no people to do it. There's no money for it. So for the past few years, uh, Conservation Lands Foundation, along with uh, a national partner of ours, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, we've partnered on an appropriations letter that we build support for through local and national nonprofits who care about conservation issues related to BLM, uh, Bureau of Land Management, not Black Lives Matter. That's a great thing too. Um, to send to the appropriations committees in the House and Senate asking for increases for certain accounts within the Bureau of Land Management budget focused on uh, cultural resource management, which is what the National Trust focuses on, and management of the National Conservation Lands, which is what Conservation Lands Foundation focuses on. And for the last few years, we've gotten two to $3 million increases for the National Conservation Lands, which is nice, um, but really isn't enough. Uh, and when we were coming into this process for the upcoming appropriations year, fiscal year 22, uh, we have a new president, we have an all democratic Congress. And so I called my colleague at the National Trust and I said, hey, um, I think we need to go big this year on an appropriations request for the, for the conservation lands. And he asked me uh, what amounts. And I said, well, they're currently getting 45.819 million. And I think they should get 65.131 million. And he said, are you on crack? And he said that because that's in a sense of almost a 50% increase, which India would tell you almost nothing in Congress ever gets a 50% increase in funding, even if it's only in the millions of dollars and not the billions. But I told him that I thought that that request was justified because 65.131 million was actually the amount that this system of lands was appropriated in 2006 when it had 11 fewer million acres. And so when he told when I told him that he said, okay, well, produce the data and let's write a really good letter and we'll see if we can get Congress to buy in. Now, whether Congress will buy in or not, I won't be able to tell you until September, October, as India said, but um, I'm gonna share my screen to show you the letter, which a few of you have seen already because you've signed it, but can everybody see this letter here? I'm going to use this as a case study to not only tell you what I'm doing, but also, I think, provide an example for uh, the best, like how to produce this letter, how to actually write a letter to your congressperson or the, the subcommittees involved to make a request. And so this letter, uh, I guess the, the first fundamental uh, thing you need to know is who are you writing it to? And India walked through the fact that there are 12 um, committees uh, within the appropriation, subcommittees within the appropriations committee, virtually everything that you would be doing if you are seeking uh, money would be through the subcommittee on interior environment related agencies. So we're sending this letter to Congresswoman Shelley Pingree of Maine, who's the chair of that subcommittee and Congressman David Joyce of Ohio, who is the ranking member. My Every letter I ever write to Congress, no matter what it is, but especially for appropriations, in the first paragraph, I always do two things. One is I thank them for something. They're human beings like all of us. They like to be thanked. And even if you have a really hard time finding something to thank them for because they're really horrible at what you're trying to write about, find something to thank them for. In this case, we're thanking them for the fact that they have actually, well, maybe not enough, increased funding for the accounts that we're writing about over the past few years. So I did that. And then we said, as you prepare, you wanna in one sentence say, this is what we want. This is what we're asking for. And so we are asking for an increase in these two accounts. 
this letter is a little longer because I had a lot of things to justify um, and we're actually asking for two different things, but you don't want it, you want to avoid going on and on and spit and sending 10 pages of text about stuff like this. You can, if it's a very technical issue, but in my mind, and from also being on the other side, I didn't work on appropriations as a staffer like India did, but just working on authorization bills and other things, it was very hard to read 10 page letters of text about things if they weren't very, like super technical issues. And so I would suggest that within no more than three paragraphs, you tell the story of what this is you're asking for and why. And so I'm going to scroll down here to the second part of this letter, which is the part that I'm focused on. And so in this paragraph, I set the stage for the fact that BLM needs more money for these lands because they are incredibly important lands of historic, cultural, ecological, and scientific values. And then this just tells the different types of units of lands that are within the system. And then I go into about two paragraphs across this page break here, um, explaining that we're asking for this money because the system has increased twofold in the last 20 years and has actually had its funding reduced. And then explain what this money would do. So, we're asking for a sharp increase in order to properly administer the, ex the system's expansion since 2000 and to ensure that the lands are inventoried and monitored and protected for cultural resources and uh, various other actions that the agency needs to take in its management of these lands. And then this might only appeal to the Democrats on the, on the subcommittee, but the landscapes that we are asking for more money to manage are critical to a national goal that the president has set to conserve and protect 30% of our lands and waters by 2030. That's something that he declared in an executive order last month. It's something that many members of Congress have endorsed. It's actually an international goal that the United States has adopted towards broader climate crisis mitigation efforts. And then I threw in another paragraph that goes into more detail about how the money ideally should be spent. It needs to be spent to staff the agency with more land managers so that there are people on the ground actually managing the land, law enforcement for doing the work that law enforcement does on, on our public lands and cultural resource experts to manage the cultural resource issue, issues on those landscapes. Once you've done that, you close out by thanking them again uh, and reiterating, you know, the importance of the issue that you're writing about. And then <laughs> normally you would just have a letter that closes out with a list of organizations that support it, which this letter is still open and we're still getting signatures. But where uh, my letter diverges perhaps from others and this might freak India out a little bit as a former appropriation staffer is because I felt I needed to justify a 50%, almost 50% increase in funding. And I, I gave basic information like, yes, we, it's increased this number of acres and it's the money has come down and never come back up. What I did is I did my research through Congressional Research Service and put together a, a table that shows the appropriation for the national conservation lands every year since 2000 and how it changed relative to the number of acres that were added to the system as those years went on. And so you'll see here in 2006, Congress appropriated 65.131 million acre or million dollars to manage the national conservation lands as they were at the time. And it was roughly in the 50s and 60s up until 2009. And then they cut it almost by half. And then since then, for many years, it didn't go up at all. Then it progressively has gone up a little bit. And now we're at about 75, 70%, I guess, of what it was at its peak. But here you'll see these are the acres representing all of the units of the national conservation lands that have been added either by Congress or by a president of the United States since then. 
including 7 million acres added in 2016. So that's one data point to show there isn't enough money to manage all these places that Congress is passing laws to say need to be protected and that the president is saying needs to be protected. To further illustrate that, I produced a graph that runs off of these numbers that shows the divergence of increase. The blue line is the number of acres going up, especially here at that 7 million acre addition, and where the appropriations actually come down uh, relative to that. Then this is a list of 101 units of the National Conservation Lands added to the system. And the number of acres that BLM manages in each of these units since 2006, the peak of the appropriation. To further illustrate that these are all places that they're not spending enough money to manage. But wait, there's more. Oh, actually, I don't have it in this copy here. But I also have maps that show the growth of the system on the map over that time. One map from 2000, one map from 2008, and another map from 2020. That's a very long way of hopefully selling Congress on the case that they need to give this money to give the Bureau of Land Management the ability to manage these places. Now, I'm not suggesting that you and California Desert Coalition should go to all of that detail. Maybe you need to for whatever it is you're asking for. But the point is, you should never just ask for money without providing clear justification and to the extent that it's possible data to prove it. Every time I've ever met with an appropriation staffer, whether it's somebody who works for an individual member of Congress or somebody who actually staffs the committee on appropriations, they are super nerdy wonks who want detail. They need to be able to justify requests like this. So it might not be this much, but the, my point is when you're gonna write your letter, you don't just say, well, we need $5 million because this project would be great for this community. It might be great for this community, but that's not enough. You need to be able to provide the detail and you need to be able to do it in a way that doesn't take a hundred pages. Um, you need to be very clear and succinct in how you present that data. Um, and you know, it might take a number of years for you to get where you're trying to get. I, we, we are not submitting this number uh, with the expectation that we will get it. But we're hoping that if they, think that that's too much of an increase, maybe they'll say, well, we'll give it 60. And we'll be very happy with 60, considering that's a 33% increase over what we had last year. And so it's all about working the system, continuing to be an advocate for the cause that you're asking Congress to fund. Um, and like virtually everything in Congress, the work never stops. So um, hopefully this provides at least a, a general case study for you to understand kind of the work that should go into the request um, with a clear understanding that even if you identify a program within a federal agency that needs more money or a project, it's going to be a multi-year effort and you need to build consensus among, as Mariana and India both pointed out, the members of Congress in the area where you're seeking funding to be supportive of it. As much as your organization might care about it. Um, you need congressional engagement on these things. And also, the more you can get the support of as many people in your community as possible behind these things, as well as other organizations uh, to support requests like this, uh, the better off you are. And that's fundamentally why um, we're getting all these national organizations and state-based organizations to sign this letter because there are members from states all across the country on this subcommittee. I want them to see that there are organizations in their state who care about this. And it's not just Conservation Lands Foundation and the National Trust. So I will stop there and I will stop sharing this and I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you, David. Um, before we open up for some questions for you, I do want to, um, have you kind of reiterate a couple things that you said? I'm going to pose this in the form of 
questions, um, but I know you did talk about it and uh, I think it would be helpful to just revisit briefly. Um, the, the letter that you've shown and the, the number that you're requesting, the, the appropriations, the, the funding that you're requesting, um, is that something, this is a rhetorical question, <laughs> is that something that you would recommend an individual emulate versus a group or a consortium of folks or a coalition of folks? And I ask because, I know what your answer is gonna be, um, because many of us do think you gotta fight government for, for everything, right? And so there's, there is a thinking around strategy that says, if I ask for a lot more, we'll negotiate down, but I'll still end up with a lot. But there's the other side of the coin, which India was was speaking to earlier, that as perhaps as an individual, perhaps as, as a group, once that request hits the ear of the staff person receiving it, there is a point at which you shoot yourself in the foot and they say, nah, this is unrealistic. I'm not even going to deal with it. So what, what would be your um, advice for an individual versus members of a larger group around what is realistic? Well, so I kind of have two answers for that. First, the type of increase that I'm seeking in my requests, I would not be asking for that percent of an increase if there was not a historical reason that I could justify for it. So if the National Conservation Lands had never had $65 million and we were at 45 million now, I wouldn't be asking for 65 million. I would be asking for you know a 10% increase and I would hope that maybe I'd get eight or seven. The only reason I'm doing it this way is because I'm trying to demonstrate to Congress that they have undermined their own mandate to the Bureau of Land Management for managing these lands. Um, so you, you have to be reasonable. You can aim high. <laughs> but you, you shouldn't name that I if, if it's not a situation like the one I am working on. Um, to, your, to the specific question about an individual constituent, I'll speak to how I used to receive. So I, like I said, I didn't work on appropriations issues as a Hill staffer, but I did have the, the glorious effort of responding to constituent mail from Florida's 19th district on every issue that anybody sent a letter on including appropriations. And what a, lot of, what a lot of organizations do, not mine, but what a lot of like very big national organizations do is the organization will send the letter that I'm writing on behalf of the organization, but then they'll ask their members, their constituents to send letters to Congress, their members asking for an increase in that funding. And so you know, let's just say it was actually um, Land and Water Conservation Fund is another example that like India gave of, uh, you know, a, a program that Congress created many, many years ago and up until literally last year never appropriated full funding for. Um, I used to get letters and emails all the time from constituents saying the Land and Water Conservation Fund needs to be fully funded. Please vote to fully fund it. But those letters from individual people did not ask for a number. They just said, we support this program. So the, the advocacy organization who had lobbyists like me would send the letter saying, you should appropriate $900 million a year to Land and Water Conservation Fund. And then they would have 100,000 people send letters to Congress saying, please fully fund land and water conservation fund. That's the way to do it because you want members of Congress to understand that there is support for a program, that there's 
that they have political capital of their constituency behind them saying we should spend this money. But an individual mem an individual constituent saying you should give 65.131 million, no. I hope everybody understands the, the differentiation there. But to, to that point, like you as an individual citizen who is paying taxes that are funding these programs, you do have a right and you should email your congressperson and say, I support this program, please fund it. And then subscribe to an organization like the Cal Desert Coalition that can write a letter and say, give X amount to this program. Thank you. Um, Indy, I wanna give you a chance to weigh in on that as well. Yeah, I mean, David is exactly right. Um, there, you know, we're, I'm a lobbyist now. That's what being director of federal affairs is a fancy title for lobbyist. Um, so when I go in to talk to offices, you know, these days, I'm not asking for money for anything. Uh, my job at the Electronic Frontier Foundation is uh, we're pro-privacy, anti-surveillance, stuff like that. And so some of the appropriations requests that I've made in the last couple of years is to ban funding for any facial recognition products at either Homeland Security or DOJ. Uh, facial recognition is massively problematic and uh, racist and doesn't work and is really expensive and it's a waste of taxpayer money. So don't spend any money on that. Um, so it's a little bit different, but when I go in as a professional with letterhead, with the little logo pin on my lapel, I'm expected to be able to justify my requests with data and facts and figures and whatever. And so I'm meeting with the subject matter expert and we're gonna have a conversation about the subject. When you're writing a letter as a constituent to your member, they don't need that level of detail and they don't expect you to have that level of detail. They just want to know that you support this program. And being specific is helpful, but um, you know, it's the different organizations will do letter writing campaigns for members of their organization. And the reason they do that is because it works. Um, it's hard to do because uh, you really do need a vast volume of members because you need enough people to write enough letters to enough of the 435 members that it's actually a critical mass and it gets noticed, but it works when it does. Um, so, you know, it's when you are a professional and you're going in, you do have to be careful about the request that you're making. It's not one of those things where shoot for the stars and you'll end up from the moon. It's shoot for the stars and you might miss and now you're lost in outer space forever. So you have to be able to justify the thing that you're asking. You have to be able to answer the question why. And especially when you're asking for more money, you really need to be able to show why. And I think David's justification is totally valid. Like if I were the staff for listening to that, I would definitely go look and see about why they cut the funding back as much as they did. You know, we've increased the acres that you have to manage, but you've decreased the amount of money that you have to do it. That seems problematic to me. Um, so go back and do some research with the agency and figure out why the change was made in the first place and what we can do to fix that, et cetera especially with the new administration that is possibly more focused on conservation and stuff like that. Um, and it's a little easier to have those conversations with the agencies and with the committees before the bill is written and before they start making all the numbers add up to whatever the 302B is. So, um, you know, I think the chart is actually pretty useful. You know, that that's a good way to give, I would definitely listen to that pitch and I would take it to my boss you know, the bosses get to decide from there. But that's not the type of thing you need to put in a constituent letter because the intern sorting your letter is going to be deeply confused and not know what to do with it and not know how to respond. And that's the reality of what you're dealing with. Whatever you, especially if you call, but even if you write an email, what the volume was. So when I was a legislative director for freshmen, so it's more um, happens when you're a freshman we got about 5,000 letters incoming per week. That's not necessarily 5,000 unique letters because some people like to send you the same letter 50 times a day. So, but still you have to sort those. So when you have to sort through 5,000 calls and emails and faxes because people still fax Congress, I don't know why, but they do. Calls, emails, physical mail, faxes, 
the interns and the junior staff are the ones that are going through and sifting what all the mail goes and how they're coding it and how they're putting it into the individual members database. So you want to make it as easy for the intern as possible to put your letter in the correct stack in the database. So when the member, when they run the mail report at the end of the week, the, the member sees, I got 50 letters supporting desert conservation. That's all they're gonna see. Any brilliant argument you make in the letter is gonna get lost in the mail report, but you wanna make sure that you're in the mail report. So it's way more useful for you to get 50 neighbors to write the same letter that says, I support desert conservation than it is for you to write the same letter 50 times because 49 of those times are gonna get trashed. We do a deduping process in the system because you only get to vote for the boss once. You only, your opinion only gets to count once on the same thing. So that's why letter writing campaigns, that's why organizations have them, that's why neighborhood, whatever, you have to include your address because we need to be able to verify that you are a person who exists in this district, that you're voting, you are a person who is represented by this member. So we need your full address. But if you get your neighbors to send the exact same letter, it's gonna actually count a bunch of times as opposed to you doing the same thing 20 times, which is just not useful. Yeah, as as the legislative correspondent, who is which is the person responsible for drafting the responses to letters that come to Congress, um, I can tell you that they do count. Like every letter that comes from constituents is accounted for. There is a weekly report that is given to the members so they understand. And uh, there was nothing more fun than coming into the office one day and finding 150 emails or letters that say the exact same thing from constituents that I then had to draft a response to. Um, so yeah, it, you, I get questions all the time from people, you know, does it matter if I write in or call in? It does. I mean, I can't say all 535 House and Senate members care, um, but everyone that I've ever worked with, they do actually keep track of who calls and who writes. So as a as a point of strategy, that is an important to note. I think what we've heard here tonight is one point of strategy is to target the appropriators and uh, coalesce with either existing organized groups, nonprofits, mm -hmm. what have you, um, if you're lucky enough to have a lobbyist, <laughs> that helps, um, uh, and draft something akin to what David is working on that he showed us, something with that sort of structure, uh, or as individuals, and perhaps um, in a more grassroots, organize your neighbors, organize your immediate community kind of way, you can write into your member of Congress um, as, as a, with constituent mail, essentially what we've just heard about supporting um, appropriations for you know, increasing funding for the Bureau of Land Management, for example. And it could be the exact same um, letter or similar enough, but with those words, it will get sorted. And if there's enough of them, there has to be a specific response to it. And if there's enough of them, at some point that does get to the boss that, hey, this is a real priority amongst your constituents. Maybe we need to you know, look into this. Um, so that's as, as a strategic point, I think that is um, important to note. Um, let's, we, we're going to end at seven, so we only have four minutes. Um, so let's take a few more questions. There are some questions in the chat, but I want to see if anybody um, would like to speak their question. If anybody has anything that they want to say out loud. Otherwise, if you have registered a question in the chat, hold on, I will get to the question. Um, one of our board members has her hand up. <laughs> Claudia, is this the same question that you have in the chat or a different one? Um, this is slightly different. Um, listening to what uh, Dave said, if we're if our organization <clears throat> wants to support his letter or another position, do we direct it? Uh, do we do a direct letter to the chairman as he has done of that appropriations subcommittee, um, or should we? 
first um, direct a letter to the California um, member on that subcommittee? What's, a, what's appropriate for us to do? Great question. Um, particularly because you don't have a demonstrated history of advocacy on these things, I would suggest you start with the member. Well, okay, there's two things. One, you should reach out to your member of Congress, even if they're not on the committee. Like Jay Obernolte is not on the appropriations committee, but they can submit appropriations requests. And so you should definitely try to work with them as India mentioned before. Hopefully you're successful at that, although remains to be seen. But I do think there is value to enlisting the support of a member on the subcommittee who is from your state, who might have an understanding of the issues, even if it's not in their district. So Josh Harder from California is on this subcommittee. Um, and actually as a finer point on my letter, I'm having, so we're working with Susie Lee in Nevada, right across the border from you guys. Um, she's gonna submit it as an official appropriations request through her, her priorities while we're sending a letter to the full committee. But that's a long way of saying, I think you should do all of the above. And when you've become a known quantity for advocating on something over a period of a few years, and you've established those relationships with the members and the staff and the committee, um, even if you have no other organizations backing you, it, it becomes a little easier because you're considered a subject matter expert and you're not just some random organization they don't know anything about. Thank you. It's all about relationships. Mariana, you're I'm muted. <laughs> One other quick question from the chat, um, and then we will, I'll turn it over to Fraser to wrap up. Um, I also want to just mention that if you had a question in the chat that was not, uh, that we didn't get to, I am making note and keeping all of the the questions from the chat um, and I will make sure to get answers for you. And I will circle up with David and India um, after this to see if they would be willing to uh, field any mm -hmm. additional questions directly or they can always come through our organization info at desertcoalition.org. Um, Happy to. Great, thank you. So the the last quick question from the chat was uh, just a question about the reduction, that steep drop in appropriations and why, if you know why that took place and was it um, a party line issue? So it was not actually a party line issue. Um, and actually, so the, the drop occurred alongside the recession of 2008 and nine when virtually every, everything the government was spending on, except for probably the Department of Defense, was cut significantly. So first, there was just a drop in spending because there was no revenue coming in. And then there was also a process called sequestration that basically gave a haircut off of every government agency, except for the Department of Defense, I think, um, to oh. further cut spending. Was defense also cut? Yeah, that's right. It was. It, was a big, it was a big deal because this was the yeah. first time where the Department of Defense actually had a budget cap. Yeah, you're right. That's right. So yeah, it, it was. And the, the finer point on that to your question is Barack Obama was president and the Democrats had majorities. Now, Republicans, I'm sure, absolutely wanted interior cut because especially for the national conservation lands, they probably didn't think we should be paying for conservation. Um, but the reality is there were a lot of difficult decisions that needed to be made and the interior department for, uh, right or wrong is not considered a most important federal agency. And when you have to make very difficult spending decisions in the middle of a recession, you're going to cut less for defense and health and human services than you are the interior department, which is misunderstood by most people anyway. <laughs> so there, there's a lot fewer people complaining about interior spending than there are health and human services and education and almost every other federal agency, maybe not state. Um, I know state got a huge, so sequestration, yeah. like there were, so during sequestration, everybody took a 10% cut. They, and so they were allowed, the agencies were allowed to sort of figure out 
where it came from, but it had to be 10%. And so then what happened the next few years is some of the agencies got quote unquote back to normal and agencies like Interior, Labor, Health, Human Services, State Foreign Ops, they just didn't. So some of those bills just kept getting cut. For like I think the next year, the labor age bill was at 2004 levels, and this was like 2010 or something like that. Yeah. And um, state foreign ops was in incredibly bad shape for a long time. In fact, I was in Congress when Benghazi happened, um, and that was after a number of years of the state foreign ops bill getting cut and cut and cut and cut and cut. And so when the whole Benghazi attack first happened because of the bad infrastructure and all this other stuff, our first thought in the office was, this is so terrible. Maybe we can actually get the funding that we need to do the things that we need to do in all of these other agencies because the Republicans have been cutting this money for so long because why would we send money overseas? And this is the type of thing that happens. Maybe we can actually reverse this trend and start doing that. And that's totally not what happens at all. Well, and while the Democrats were in charge when the recession forced those initial cuts and sequestration, Republicans did end up taking over the House and then the Senate. Um, so they continued those policies for a few years, even while the economy was recovering. And so that's how you ended up with, specifically for the National Conservation Lands, the, the basic flatlining of the funding. Um, and I did actually find um, efforts to cut it even more. Like the, the committees left it flat, but there were requests for even uh, more cuts. So, you know, it, it's politics. Mm -hmm. That was the whole thing about politics versus policy. It's yeah. uh, when you're a Republican, it's really cool to hate on spending money on conservation, even though it creates jobs and is money that has to be spent domestically and can never be shipped overseas. Um, they don't want to spend money on conservation or restoration or anything like that. Because that's yeah. a waste of money or something. Whatever. I'm a tax and spend Democrat. That's me personally. <laughs> so I think that it's good to spend taxpayer dollars on things that are going to benefit future generations and also happen to be the morally and ethically correct thing to do. But also there's a direct benefit on spending taxpayer dollars on public lands and public works. So I was I gonna the, it, so, you know. The, uh, the important thing overall to remember is uh, that there is politics and there is policy. And even when we are um, asking for better policy, policy, we have to remember that there is also politics that uh, we do well to keep in mind when we reach out to our, um, to our representatives and what, you know, what can we tell them that will make them care. Um, so with that, we need to close. <laughs> this has been very informative and I want to thank our speakers again for spending their time with us very graciously and generously donating their time. Um, and I'll turn it over to Fraser, who's been patiently waiting to close us out. Yeah, and, uh, because of the weak internet connection, I'm just going to keep video off and that way you can all hear me loud and clear. So uh, thanks again to our speakers. And I'd also like to recognize and thank uh, our board members at the California Desert Coalition. Of course, Mariana, uh, you worked really hard on this webinar, uh, but the, these are the kind of things that our board is devoted to do, is to try and uh, bring information to the grassroots crowd in the California desert. Um, we're supported uh, recently by the Rose Foundation, along with many private donations. And we are an all volunteer organization, which means that all donations go straight to providing uh, information, running advocacy campaigns and keeping threats to the desert uh, in the public eye and, and in check. Uh, also stay tuned in April for a webinar on the future of renewable energy in the California desert. We all know it's a new administration with uh, priorities uh, for climate change and trying to build renewable energy to blunt the worst impacts of climate change. So uh, I think we've got a lot of work to do in the next few years to make sure that we don't backslide in that way at all. So uh, thanks again to everybody for spending your evening with us and visit uh, California Desert Coalition dot org. Uh, the link is on the screen there and you can find a way to uh, donate. You can learn more about our programs. 
and stay up to date with what's going on in the California desert. So thanks everybody, have a good evening. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone. Good night and good luck. <laughs> good night and good luck.